All right, so I'm going to do something a little different. Is that okay? He's got the mic. You have to say okay or you have to leave. But I don't want the bagel after church, so I'm not leaving. <laughs> so if you have, you have a piece of paper, does anybody know what a piece of paper is? You still have those anymore? Or a place to write is fine. I'm just going to give you some key words that the Lord gave me this morning. And, I, you know, I haven't really talked much about dreams that I've had, uh, but maybe it was the prophetic conference that, that got me stoked up because I woke up this morning, um, didn't completely turn over my, my plan of what I was going to talk about today, but he gave me some key words. And I was in a conference many years ago, and the, the person that was speaking said, I want you to grab a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle and draw certain key words on the left side. I'll give you those. And then see if the Holy Spirit says anything to you about those keywords on the right side. Was that clear the way I just explained it? So you'll draw a line down the middle of the page, and I'll give you a couple of keywords, put them on the left, and then see as we're talking about the subject if the Lord shows you anything on the right. You know, you can write down your notes on the right. Sorry if that was confusing. I'm getting enough head nods. Okay. Ask for help if, you, if you're not sure. So... Um, Lord, we just ask you to open up our hearts again like we sang this morning and that our attention would be focused on what you want to say to us today because really, man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we want to hear a proceeding word this morning. It needs to have life and nourishment in it, Lord. So would you anoint those words to bring life I keep hearing what Jesus said. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. He actually was nourished by hearing the voice of the Lord and then doing what the Lord told him. Beautiful picture, isn't it? All right, so at the top of the left side, you can put the word spiritual immunity. And I already talked about that a little bit already this morning. We know that we have a natural immune system. And if you know anything, you know, from the last two years, this is a picture of the coronavirus on the left here. And then there's the cross of Jesus with the nail and then the blood of Jesus that's a barrier against that thing coming into our lives, right? So we're protected, sheltered from global plagues in the earth. And I'm going to read Revelation 3.10 in a minute to show you that. So spiritual immunity is similar in a lot of ways to our natural immunity, and there's things you can do to improve your natural immunity, right? You know that, the way you live, the way you eat, exercise, there's a lot of things that you can do, take supplements, and there's a lot of things you can do negatively that could hurt your immunity. And man, I know I don't have to talk about that. Stress sure isn't good. And if Jesus, uh, well, if Isaiah 26 says, I will give you perfect peace when you keep your mind stayed on me. That'll help both your physical and your spiritual immunity, okay? So under that now, let's just put number one, gratitude. All right, so that's, that's my first thing that the Lord showed me in, when I woke up this morning and he had me write these things down. That's a really good place to start. It's certainly not the only thing, but it's a really good place to start by giving thanks. I will enter his gates with Thanksgiving in my heart, right? That's, that's the first part of the entry to wake up and instead of allowing the enemy to, to persecute you and prosecute you in that law court and say, yeah, but look at all the things you don't have and cause you to be envious and, and jealous of other people. No, no, I think I'm going to start by, I woke up today. I can thank him for that. I'm in a house. I'm not outside when it's six degrees in, on, on the thermometer in my car. Is that what it is? A thermometer? Whatever takes the temperature? Thermometer is what you put in your mouth. <laughs> Sorry. It was six when I got in my car. And I'm like, hey, the, the heat's working. I'm good. So many things. If we could give him thanks. And we could just start that. And, and remind ourselves during the course of the day. And then blood work. I, I mentioned that. That would be number two under, under gratitude. And, and blood work clearly is what we have to do when we get tested for COVID. And you know, whatever, they have to swab your brain, it seems like people were saying they would put that Q-tip so far up your nose, whatever, your IQ dropped, <laughs> took a couple of IQ points with it when they pulled it out, so we'll talk about blood work, and then we'll talk about the scriptural supplements, because like I said, if you want to increase your immune system in your body, there's, there's certain diet you can follow, there's, there's things you can avoid eating, that will help your immune system be stronger. Sugar. Sorry, did somebody say something? 
That's already been proven. I can get, I could send you the, send you the research. And then number four would be worship. Broad topic. I know that's a lot to talk about, but it's a yieldedness. Uh, if you, if you want a word in commas, uh, parentheses around it, worship to me means yieldedness. And often in scripture, people would fall down at the feet of Jesus without him asking. Why would they do that? They just sense his presence. Even the man that was demon-possessed, right, fell down at the feet of Jesus, and, and he worshipped him. And Bill Johnson, I, I heard him say this. I'm going to give him the credit. He said, not e well, you have to know one other thing. It says that the demons left that man, and they went into the pigs, about 2,000 pigs. Remember that in the Gospels? He said, even the guy had to have at least 2,000 demons if there was 2,000 pigs, Right? Even 2,000 demons couldn't stop that man from kneeling down and worshiping Jesus. Isn't that brilliant? Like, it's really a decision in our heart, what we're going to choose to look at. And if we're going to allow all this, that spirit of fear, right? It's not just fear. It's a spirit of fear. God didn't give you the spirit of fear. He gave you a spirit of power, a holy spirit of love and a sound mind. Claim the sound mind. We haven't sung it in a while, but there's a verse that says, when I am in the storm, the storm is not in me. Never forgot it. Like, that is such a great way for me to picture it. Doesn't matter if all this stuff is raging around me. My feet are on the rock. I'm not going to be shaken. And then prayer would be the next one. So that's number five, right? Tracking. And then there's two bullet points under prayer. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is just the dream I had, so take it or leave it. The first bullet point is speaking, and the other is listening. Because a lot of times people just think of prayer in that first regard of, of speaking and asking and requesting. That's why I said in James, you have not because VJS not. But what about just making prayer listening? We're not so good at that in such a busy culture and when we have so many distractions. I'm curious. Let's take a poll. Did anybody here, when I told you to write down notes, when you looked at your phone, you had to check Facebook or check your email before you started writing it down? It's really easy for that to happen. You don't have to raise your hand. I'm not asking. I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but that's just how life is these days, right? It's just very distracting. It's hard to just sit and listen and call that prayer. And then number six, guard your gates. Sounds like you already know what that means. And then the last thing, um, I'm just going to call it volunteer, okay, for, for lack of a better word. It could mean a lot of things to different people, but I'll, I'll get into that. But if you want to just put a second word for volunteer, put the word redemption, all right? You guys seem like you're tracking with me. I appreciate that. All right, so I'll go through some scriptures, and I'll try to tie back to my list and, and try to say how if we do these seven things, really eight because there's two parts to prayer, right? But... Um, Eight's a good number because that's, that's new beginnings. And, and just what I feel like the Lord's been showing me because, um, you know, again, like I said about Leslie, you know, that job that she has normally could, could turn you into a very, uh, I don't know, angry sometimes is how some of the attorneys I've met can feel sometimes. Or, or even the injustice that you see in the system sometimes can cause you to, to get hardened and, and want to give up. And we were watching a movie uh, that was... Uh, called The Great Debaters. Denzel Washington was the one that put it together. It's a great movie. I highly recommend it if, if you can watch it. And, um, you know, it's a true story, apparently. And uh, it was an African-American college in Texas. Uh, and, and Denzel Washington played the lead role of the, of the teacher in the college that was teaching them how to debate. And they, they move through. And he, he motivates these children that students, but one of them was young, like a gifted guy that got in early, whose father was a preacher. And I won't, I won't break the plot line, but basically he went off his notes when it came time for the big debate. And he knew that that would be okay to do it because he sensed in his heart that the Lord, was, I feel like the Lord was directing him, okay? So I guess the point there is Martin Luther King, the greatest speech of all time, people say is, I have a dream speech, right? Well, he wasn't going to say that. It wasn't in his notes that day. But it was in his heart to be open if the Lord was saying something to him. And it was actually Mahalia Jackson, the gospel singer, sitting behind him a couple rows back. She said, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. 
and you can hear her if you get the recording, and there's not like a flinch on his face. He just shifted the gear. He went off the notes, and he said, I have a dream. Like, he caught it right in the moment. And I don't know, I guess I say this a lot, but we're supposed to all be living that way. Living alive to the present, to the moment. What does God want to say to this person right here, right now? And if people criticize Christians, it's often that we're judgmental. And, you know, you, you can argue if you want, but if that's what the, a lot of them are saying, that means we're not really living in the moment. We're not really soft-hearted towards people. We, we end up causing them to feel condemned. So part of our spiritual immune system has to be, Lord, keep my ears open to what you want to say. Let me be alert and awakened and not have that blind spot. All right, so the first verse is Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Read it with me, all right? Can you say it out loud? Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Does that apply to today? Has there been a trial that has come upon the whole world to test those who are on the earth? Have you had to persevere? There you go. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you. I'll protect you. I'll shelter you from the global plagues in the earth and keep you in the hour of trial. That hour of trial is when you, you face those crossroads. You come up to that crossroad where you have to make a decision left or right. And that's what this young guy did in that debate. He knew what his notes said, but he was staying alert to what was going on in the course of the debate. And he finished it with something the Lord dropped in his heart right in the moment. And I think that's how we're all supposed to live. And then it says in Haggai, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens, the sea, and the land. That's referred to in Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews quotes that verse, and he says the words once more indicate removing what can be shaken, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. So please think about your life for a minute right now, because I even referenced that when we were singing about the fire that Trisha saw, right? That, that, that the Lord wants us to keep a fire burning in our hearts, and that's a very vivid picture in the Old Testament when they would go into the temple behind the curtain of the Holy of Holies, there was the mercy seat, and that's where they had to keep the fire burning on that mercy seat. They couldn't let that fire go out. What a great picture for us. And, you know, your immune system, if we were going to compare, if it was getting weak, it would be like the flames are starting to flicker down. So we're saying, Lord, whatever dead wood in my life needs to go, I bring it and I lay it at the altar. I present that to you, trusting you that whatever I was leaning on before that wasn't from you, you will replace it with a better option. You'll show me the new way that you want me to live. When Jesus came out of the tomb, his body was somewhat the same but also better. And that's what resurrection does. That's what redemption means. You redeem when you follow the Lord. You take what was broken and it, it becomes redeemed. Think of Shawshank's redemption. Shawshank, sorry. What cannot be shaken may remain. So there I go. Whatever, whatever can be shaken, I got to be confident enough to the Lord to say, yes, I don't want it. That storm came through and high winds, any dead branches in the tree were on the ground. But that doesn't mean the tree got weaker because they were dead branches. So the pushing and the stress that you get is not necessarily a bad thing because it forces you to have to learn how to push back. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, say that with me, all right? We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Look at somebody else and say, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Whew, that's good news. So let us be thankful. There it is, gratitude. So worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. And a time is coming, in fact has come, when you will be scattered each to your own home. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> what does isolation do to your spiritual immune system? Ugh, that's a good description. However you spell that, we'll put that in the uh, ugh. Yeah, I hear you. And it, wouldn't it just be the plan of the enemy to test us to see what was real in our lives and what, what didn't get shaken and what did get shaken? And this could sound like a condemning message, and I hope it doesn't, because I'm really not saying it for anything other than our spiritual nourishment. 
you could actually thank God for showing you something that you were leaning on that was a counterfeit. And say, well, I didn't see it. That's why they call it a blind spot. But now that you revealed it, Lord, I'm going to do something about it. I want to get rid of that thing, whatever it was. And it was maybe not even a terrible thing. It wasn't openly sin. You weren't doing anything illegal. But it wasn't optimal. It wasn't the best way that we can live before God. I don't think that ever changes for the rest of our lives. That he's going to keep on showing us ways that we can become more and more like him. The marriage conference will do that for us, too because we'll get to hear our spouses through a different lens. And they want what's best for us, don't they? I better not go there. Okay. That was in John 16, right? So Jesus is saying, even though you guys are going to leave me alone, you're going to be scattered each to your own home, but I'm not going to be alone. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And do you believe that about your Father in heaven? Yes, right? But I, when I was growing up, there was a song called Papa Was a Rolling Stone. Remember that one? Wherever he laid his hat was his home. And when he died, all he left us was alone. Yikes. If that doesn't say it right there, like, wow. Yeah, that was real. That's what he used to say. Keep it real. That's real. That's how a lot of people feel about their fathers, right? Like, whoa. And we can't project that onto God. When you, when you wake up and gratitude is the first thing for your immune system, you're saying, no, Lord, no, you're not like my earthly father. And you might have had a great earthly father, right? Honor your father and mother that life may go well with you. So don't mean to be talking bad about people. You have no idea what they went through, right? So don't do that. That's what Trisha might touch on this week on Wednesday night, is we talked about it last week. And, and unforgiveness towards our mothers and fathers can really slow, our, slow down our immunity. So we've just come to the conclusion that they did the best they could with what they knew and what they did. And, and you might say, well, that wasn't very good. Well, yeah, but again, like, you didn't walk in their shoes, so hang out. Hurt people, hurt people. Maybe that father that was a Rolling Stone got saved. <laughs> Yet I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take art. I have overcome the world. Do you believe that? And if he's living in you, that means you have the ability to overcome the world as well. And look, you know, we, we can get very legalistic around uh, disciplines like did you pray? How long did you pray today? Well, you only prayed a half hour, but if you prayed an hour, you'd be a better Christian. Yeah, be careful. Your heart's got to be in it, right? You, you have to be doing it out of a hunger for God. David was a man after God's own heart. He was, he was pursuing God. It's hard to do that with a formula. It's hard, you know, Jack Frost, again, he does a great teaching on this, that it's not just about your willpower. It is good to be disciplined as a Christian and to, and to fast, right? To fast is not easy. Your flesh doesn't like it, right? I'm not the only one, but it's still, it's part of that worship yielding that I really do take my authority from you, Lord. You're the, you're the final answer, not Google. You get a lot of answers on Google, but they're not always God's answer. I can tell you that. So then I was re doing some research, and it said uh, this poll was taken in the mid-80s, mid and they were asking ministers around the country, what do you think America will be like in the year 2000? If you're old enough to remember Y2K and all of that, right? So this quote came from, the, from one of those surveys, and the man said, by 2000, Christians in America will be a conscious minority surrounded by an arrogant, militant paganism. Pretty good, right? In 2022, here we are 22 years later than what they were predicting. But is that a good thing or a bad thing? Like, sorry, but like, I never forgot this joke. Got a couple of salesmen in the room. Jim's in the back there. This guy gets hired to sell shoes. And he goes out and they send him out to a Native American Indian reservation. And he calls up and he says, man, nobody here wears shoes. I quit. So they hire a replacement, and the guy goes in, and he goes, oh, my God, nobody here wears shoes. This is amazing. You get it? You know, sorry if I offended any Native American Indians, but 
I'm just saying. It's all how you look at the opportunity. And if people are hurting and we have a heart for souls, this should be great for the kingdom because they are hurting. Let's just put that right out there. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know people are hurting right now. And they, you know, they, it seems to be getting worse in some ways after two years of all of this. However bad you think America is, it's not even close to what Paul lived in when he was planting churches, okay? So that might be another way you could be grateful because this guy was being threatened. His life was being threatened on a regular basis. And my relatives, the Romans, man, they didn't mess around. There was no Miranda rights. If you broke the law, crucify. Okay? Like, you didn't have any rights. You just, if they didn't like you, they put you on display naked on a cross. And as you're, as you're going into, they would line the roads on the way into the town as, as a visual. Okay, you want to break the law? This is what's going to happen. I think people probably cooperated pretty well. An arrogant, militant paganism. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have been one of these people before I got saved. I used to mock it. My own mother. I used to mock my own mother, God forbid. She's the one that led me to the Lord. But when she was first telling me about Jesus, I thought, you got, you got drafted into some cult. What the heck happened to you? We're good Catholics. No, sorry. I won't go there. <laughs> I didn't mean to hurt anybody feeling on that one. But like she used to be a good Catholic, but now all of a sudden she was talking about Jesus way more. Anybody here mind being called a Jesus freak? I don't mind. You can call me that all day now, but at the time it was a derogatory thing. And she, you know, she just didn't give up. She was like a pit bull, man. She locked on and she wasn't letting go. It was the love that pushed it through. But, but there was an antagonistic thing in me, an arrogant, militant paganism, because I knew if she was right, I was going to have to make some major changes. And I don't want to make any major changes. I don't think most people do. So we shouldn't look at this as a bad thing, is all I'm saying, okay? It's an opportunity on a regular basis to show other people what you have is so much better than what they have, if you look at it through that lens. And then in Joel 2.17, it says, Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. That's quite the obligation, isn't it? That we are supposed to think about the people around us and recognize that we are here for such a time as this. And we don't want to live our lives in futility, hoping, Jesus, just come back and get us out of here. It's such a mess here. I just want to fly away. No. He said, occupy until I come. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violence... Take it by force, not, and not in a militant way. It's the love of God that wins people. The Roman Empire didn't go down under military force. It went down under Christianity being clearly the better way to live life. It's amazing that that happened. But those were, those were people that were, were all in. They had bought in. So I'm going to be that priest that weeps between the porch and the altar. And we all have a different burden, let's just say. If you want to think about a prayer burden, think of Nehemiah. Because when somebody came back to the palace, he had it pretty good, right? He was working for the king. And, and this man described what, what Jerusalem was like. And he just wept. That happens often. Happened to David Wilkerson when he was a pastor out in the middle of Pennsylvania, right? That rural, rural place. He saw one cover of Life magazine. And the Lord so convicted him about those kids that were on trial in the gang that if these kids just could hear the good news, maybe that could change it. He shows up in New York City not knowing anything, and he gets in trouble, and, you know, he's driving around. There was no GPS back then. But God kept showing him that he was on a mission from God. I don't know how well you know the book. It's called The Cross and the Switchblade. But I never forgot the scene. I think he was looking for Nikki Cruz. I don't remember the exact name. But he's got no map. He's just driving around in, I think it's Harlem at the time, you know, where he was driving. And he pulls over on the street and he says, hey, do you know where Nikki Cruz lives? As if he's living out in the middle of Pennsylvania somewhere and everybody knows everybody. And the guy goes, oh, yeah, it's right there. <laughs> he had pulled up in front of his house. How many people named Nikki Cruz in New York City? And it was the right one. 
like, if that's not confirming to you that it has to be God, be careful, because maybe it's not God, but he will reveal himself to us along the way, and it's so encouraging. But this weeping between the porch and the altar would be counted under that fourth point, uh, I'm sorry, fifth point, right, about prayer. Because we don't like to think about weeping. We don't like to think about having a burden for people. But, you know, Trisha quotes Jeremiah often. It's like fire shut up on my bones. I can't stop it. And it's the love of God. Paul said it's the love of God that keeps pushing me forward. It's like the energy in me. When I look at people, I have compassion for them. And I want to let them know there's a better way to live than the way that they're living right now. Will they try to criticize you? Sure, of course they will. Same thing I tried to do is try to discredit them because I really didn't want to wrestle with the implications of what they were saying because it would mean I would have to change a whole bunch of things that I was doing. So I wanted her to be wrong. But the hound of heaven is the Holy Spirit. And when he gets on your trail, look out. It says also in Joel, let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. And maybe this identifies with the identity of Israel in the midst of the Middle East. They knew that they had a covenant relationship with God. How about you? Do you know it at your core that the first part of your identity is son and daughter of the living God? Not what, what country you were born in or what nationality you are. First is, when you got born again, you became a new creation. And the first thing you say of who you are as your identity is a child of God. A child of the living God. I don't know, remember Lenny Hernandez was here, and he was in a Starbucks, and he wanted to witness people on the line, and it, it gets to be his turn, and they say, so he gave his order, and they said, what's your name? He said, son of the living God, <laughs> without thinking about it. <laughs> like the whole, pro, the whole place heard him, and he's like, oh my God, I probably just embarrassed myself. So the, the drink goes down the line, and the girl goes, son of the living God, your drink is ready. <laughs> <laughs> By telling it right? So he's like, oh, God, you know, he gets the drink and he walks over to the sound of the table. And a guy walks up to him and says, are you the son of the living God? <laughs> right? I got a witness here. You were there at that meeting. And he said, I, I've been searching. And are you talking about Christian? Are you, you know, are you talking about the Bible? 45 minutes later, he led the guy to the Lord. So even our mistakes wasn't really a mistake, right? But even the times we think we're embarrassing ourselves, God uses those things because you've got to know your identity. They knew their identity. He was saying, the priest was saying, actually the Lord was saying to the priests, this is your cry. Spare your people, O Lord, and don't give them, don't give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Pretty good prayer, huh? Well, we should be doing this too. And, you know, we should look for fruit and we should look for results because, again, like every day that we live, we produce fruit. You agree? Well, you kind of have to, right, because I'm leading you there. But think it through that lens. Jesus said a, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So if you're producing some bad fruit, what do you have to do? You have to get down to the roots and get rid of whatever's poisoning the roots because you're going to produce fruit one way or the other. It's either going to be good or bad in God's lens. And you have complete control over that. You really do, believe it or not. Not through your strength, but through the strength of God in you, through the Word of God, through the Spirit of God living in you. Do you realize the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of you right now? No situation is too hard for him. No matter how dead it looks, right? Lazarus was dead four days, a week before Jesus was crucified, okay? He was, he was foreshadowing. It's good that I wasn't there because when we get there, he's going to be raised from the dead after four days. Jesus was raised from the dead after three. But they had a lens to look at. Well, he did it for Lazarus, so I guess it was only a week later. See, like, so there's so much more meaning than we always realize just reading it at the surface. But how does it apply to me? It's like I shouldn't feel intimidated because there's no power stronger. Death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him. The Spirit of God is too strong to be strapped down by sin. But we just have to let go, and, and that's where the spiritual immune system 
has to work. So just want to talk about the blood work for a minute because when you want to check on your own immunity, you, you get blood work done. And, and the good analysts will come back and they'll tell you, well, you're short on vitamin D. Let's just use that one, right? Everybody agree that's not controversial, that vitamin D actually helps your immune system, especially in this COVID world? No? I'm getting pushback on that too? Oh, a banana's flying at me now. Vitamin D. So uh, you live down south, you're in the sun more, you get more vitamin D. You live up in Alaska, you don't get a lot of sun, right? So people will say that that that's one of the things you could do. That sounds pretty easy. You get vitamin D at your drugstore or your shop, right? So there's things I can do. I could do the research and find out what I should be doing to improve my immune system in the natural. And, and same in the spirit. And so I said, it could sound like it's getting legalistic here, but prayer would be one of those things. Vitamin P, <laughs> okay? Where you're saying, I'm starting my day on my knees because I know that the Bible tells me that my flesh is weak. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak, so I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to say, thank you, Lord, and then I'm going to stop and listen. And I'm going to lift up specific needs or direction or how do I respond to somebody. That's specific to you, but, but blood work comes down to, well, you're a little short on vitamin P. You're deficient in vitamin B, Bible. The B-I-B-L-E. Legalism? Maybe. It's not legalism if I'm telling you reading the Bible is good for you. It's only legalistic if you can't even get to the bottom of the page and remember what you read because you're doing it for the wrong reason. That's what I'm saying. Like, it could be legalistic. Like, Dave memorized 15 verses last week, but I only memorized 10, so he's a better Christian than me. That's not the Lord. That's not the kingdom. No, it's out of the overflow of our heart, out of the overflow of our increase. And you just can't get around being a Christian and not knowing the word. That's the core. That's the authority in our life. You have to know the word, right? And there's, there's drug addicts that got saved, couldn't even read and write, and they would start prophesying scripture. Read the book by, uh, I can't think of her name right now, Chasing the Dragon by Jackie Pullinger. She was in Hong Kong ministering to junkies. These kids have been drug addicts since they're eight years old, never went to school. They were living on the streets. The Spirit of God fell. They started prophesying Scripture, never having read it before. What's too hard for God? But how available are we? That's the part I'm talking about. That's not legalism. It's just recognizing the rules of engagement. All right, I'll keep going a little further. Revelation 3, that's where the text verse came out of, right? He said, because you've persevered, I've kept you from the trial that's going to test the whole earth. What a great scripture. So he says here, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? These are the words to him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. And I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Are you allowed to appropriate this verse for yourself? Thank you. A little louder, please. Tim from the back row there. Thank you, brother. I know that you have little strength. Could this apply to people today? Yeah, they're worn down. They're mentally worn down. They're emotionally worn down. They're, they're tired of all the engagement and, and the fighting. I know that you have little strength, yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan. I'm going to pause there for a minute. It's a pretty powerful word, huh? I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I'll make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you and this is the text verse. Since you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. Can you just say that, Lord? Keep me from the hour of trial. Through this prophetic word in Revelation, you said, if I would persevere, you will keep me from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Being shaken is not such a bad thing. It's not so bad to find out where the dead branches are that need to get thrown into the fire. It's not easy. It's, it's, it's never a pleasant experience, but you come out stronger on the other side. And that's what an immune system does. Sorry, but it has to be tested. That's how it gets stronger. Mm -hmm. 
Psalm 22, verse 8. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him, since he delights in him. I don't know if you know anything about Psalm 22, but it's a prophetic picture of the crucifixion. In living color. Don't have the time to go all into it now, but right down to the gambling for his clothes. Amazing. David was full of the prophetic spirit of God, and he predicts the crucifixion in Psalm 22, which was at least 700 years before Jesus was born. Accurate to a T. Read it. Psalm 22. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him since he delights in, in the Lord. And they said the exact same thing in Luke 23, 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. So you could see how this is in the heart of the sinful man to mock God and to mock people who follow God. And to make up all kinds of stories about us. And look, Jesus said, when they slap you, don't slap back. That's hard, isn't it? Really hard. And we got to be careful that we don't think that that means you shouldn't defend yourself. Because I think he was also using it as a bigger picture. Like a metaphor that, here's the deal. Somebody gets up in your face when you live around here, right? That happens a lot. And you get back up in their face. Like, you're, you're working in their zone. They know how to do this. Black belt in arguing. You get up in their face and you don't get back at them. It disarms that spirit in them often because they're expecting you to be afraid, maybe, and you're not. And there's a piece that gets them even more annoyed. <laughs> and when you don't respond the way they're expecting, their guard comes down. And this is all out of love, by the way, right? Not because you're trying to win anything. It's like, well, I know if I argue with them, it's just going to end up in like a stalemate. But if I try a different approach, I believe that's part of what Jesus meant, was don't slap back. Don't do what they're expecting you to do. Come at it through my lens. He meets the woman at the well. He doesn't condemn her. But he could have. He knew she had had five husbands, right? He doesn't say that. He talks to her. He communicates. He builds a relationship. And then when he does tell her, she's ready to hear it. Two sermons there. Psalm 91. And everybody knows Psalm 91. That was the most preached on text at the beginning of COVID, rightfully so, that we should be reminded what our protection is. So let me just talk about guard your gates. The last two things on the list here, I tried to see if the Lord was showing you anything along the way, and you took personal notes about this, but guard your gates is, is back to the picture that you see often in the Old Testament when they rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem they were guarding the gates they were protecting the gates because that's the entry point it could be the entry point of the enemy or it could be the entry point of your provision that you need so you have to guard your gates and we would know that our five senses are like gates so you have to guard what you look at guard what you hear guard where you go not out of legalism out of common sense I don't know if you ever saw the fight between Mike Tyson and Leon Spinks, it was over in the first round. I mean, you might argue it was over before it even started. <laughs> right, right? Like, that's what even the commentators are saying. Like, Mike Tyson was, was such a good fighter. So just imagine you're going to take Leon Spinks' place and you got to fight Mike Tyson. You're going to eat a gallon of ice cream right before you, the fight? But isn't, isn't a gallon of ice cream really good? <laughs> yeah, but it's the opposite of what you want to do. You want to give yourself the best chance. Nobody plays sports and wins every game. You, you're going to lose. Paul said, run the race as if to win. Even though there's only one winner, run the race as if you're going to win. So if I'm a coach, I know I'm not going to win every game. But I, know, I could say this. It's not going to be because our team wasn't in shape. Because that's something we can control, how hard we work. Off, a lot, lot of sports analogies there. but So you being in shape is not to be legalistically giving you a whole long set of rules because that's what the Pharisees did. The Bible says the letter of the law without the Spirit kills. The Spirit gives life, but we still need the Word to give God the, the raw material to use to build our immune system, okay? So guard your gates just means I have a lot of choices of what I can listen to on my phone, 
Why not listen to the Word of God? Why not listen to worship music? Why not listen to redemptive things? And that ties into the last one, the volunteer piece, is if you're, if you're serving in a church somewhere, even if you're in children's ministry, if you're a greeter, if you're an usher, if you're out helping uh, direct traffic, if you're on the fellowship team, if you're on the worship team, there's so many ways that you can serve that doesn't seem very meaningful, like it's not that big a deal, it's not that hard. We've got feeding hands. You could be dropping off food to people if you want. It's not so much that it's a big deal, it's that you're doing it. And I don't know if it's true for you, but the Lord will drop major revelation to you in the middle of a mundane job that you're doing. Anybody else ever have this happen? You're in children's church and you had a rough morning getting there and all of a sudden this little child says something so profound. <laughs> or, or anywhere you are. It's why? It's because you made yourself available to the Lord and, and because the church is the entity that he said will not prevail. The, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. So working that way, well, nobody ever sees me. I don't ever have the microphone. Doesn't matter. Your part in that big picture is redemptive because you're part of keeping the doors open. It's what we needed in order to have church is for the volunteers to do their parts. And, and it sounds could sound manipulative when the pastor says we need more help. It's actually good to serve. You will grow. You will be humbled in a lot of different ways. And then, you know, look right here. If Jesus could do it, then, well, that, that job is below my pay grade. Well, if the founder of the organization didn't say that, maybe there's some truth in it. And that if we humble ourselves and serve, even out of the limelight, you know, he said, what you do in secret, the Lord will reward openly. Nobody has to know all the stuff you're doing. God knows. And it's like, well, he takes good care of the people who take care of his people. Should I say that again? He takes good care of the people who take good care of his people. That's you all. I'm going to finish in Psalm 91. Can we stand? And I want, to, I want to say it out loud. This is the voice version, so it might be a little different than what you're used to in Psalm 91. But we can speak this over ourselves. We can appropriate these verses to our own life. In your own time, you could do this. You could say, I will not dread the terrors that haunt the night. Make that statement, right? This is for us. This is a, a, a prayer for us. It's a song that they sang in Israel. We'll read it, though, the way he wrote it, which says you. Ready? You will not dread the terrors that haunt the night or enemy arrows that fly in the day. Think about it for a minute. Terrors that haunt me at night. No. You're not going to win. I've got the peace of God that passes all understanding. My heart and mind is set on the Lord. And he said, when I do that, he will give me perfect peace. Come on. Or the plagues that lurk in the darkness. Okay? Don't shame people. You're not wearing a mask. And they are. Don't shame them. Don't shame them. Love them. They have every right to make whatever decision. And so do you. I'll leave it there. Next one. Or the disasters that wreak havoc at noon. A thousand may fall on your left. Ten thousand may die on your right. But these horrors won't come near you. Say it. Won't come near me. These horrors will not come near me. You're building your immune system when you say it out loud. If you want to check our YouTube channel, we just put one up by Dutch Sheets, and it says... The sword of the Spirit is the spoken word of God. And he breaks down what he means by that. The word that, that's used in the Bible is the spoken word of God. When you speak this out over yourself, there's power in this. All right? That's part of that immune system. Come on. Only your eyes will witness the punishment that awaits the evil, but you will not suffer because of it. For you made the eternal your refuge, the most high your only home. No evil will come to you. Say it. No evil will come to me. One more time. No evil will come to me. Plagues will be turned away at my door. One more time. Plagues will be turned away at my door. He will command his heavenly messengers to guard me, to keep me safe in every way. Can you just thank him for angels right now? Thank you, Lord, that you give your angels charge over us. And you keep them. You assign them. Many 
haven't ever given their angel an assignment, you need to invite them in and say, hey, come in here. We're not praying to them. We're doing what the Word tells us to do. They will hold you up in their hands so that you will not crash or fall or even graze your foot on a stone. You will walk on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the lion and the serpent underfoot. Because he clings to me in love, I will rescue him from harm. I will set him. Now, we need to say this in the first person, okay? Because I cling to the Lord in love, he will rescue me from harm. He will set me above danger. You need to put your name in here. Stand on the promises of God. Psalm 91 is a good place to start. And then after that, ready? Because he has known my name, he will call upon me and I will answer. And you say first person, because I have known his name, I will call upon God and he will answer me. I will be with him, the Lord says, in trouble. I will rescue him and grant him honor. I will reward him with many good years on this earth and let him witness my salvation. So can you lift your hands for a minute? Say, Lord, we thank you for Psalm 91 and the whole corpus of the Word of God, the maps and the commentary and everything else that comes with it. You've given us a map. You've given us a way to live that causes us to prosper if we're obedient to it. You've given us your spirit on the inside. And we want a stronger spiritual immune system. We want a stronger physical immune system. We want to be lights in the midst of the darkness of this world. We want to be ambassadors for your kingdom that are not reflecting the world back to the world. We're reflecting your kingdom back to the world. And that that will result in fruit, much fruit. And, and I just want to say this, that many times we put restrictions because we look at our natural ability and we don't think we have much natural ability. But God, sa God says through his word that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. How many qualify in that category? Right, right, that's all of us. There's nothing to be proud and arrogant about. All of us in some way or another don't qualify in the natural, but it's why God is so special. He can take anything and use it if you make yourself available to him. So Lord, this week we're just asking you to, to keep us alert in the spirit, to walk with a higher level of spiritual immunity, to recognize what looks like danger could often be an opportunity that you're giving us. And we don't want to be foolish, Lord, but we want to be wise in the ways of the spirit and recognize the rules of engagement and, and step through those open doors that you promised the church of Philadelphia, that you open a door and no man could shut it. We want to walk through the open door that you give us in Jesus name and everybody said amen glory to God in the highest take it for what it's worth I had a dream and I wanted to share that dream with you and we also want to pray for people so there's going to be prayer minister at the altar hopefully nobody had any hard time getting here but I pray that you all get home safely today you got something you got to say it Just want to, church, God bless you, everyone. Wonderful service, right? I just want to uh, just be careful, please, leaving the property. Uh, when, when you come down the hill, that's still very slippery. If there's a car stopped there, you probably will slide into them. So I just want to warn you, just be careful exiting the property. God bless. Yeah, there's a lot of salt and everything on there, but people don't realize that they hit that hill going a little fast. And if, if there's any little bit of ice, right? So just that's all. Just be precautious. But can you just do me a favor? There, there's going to be people here. There is every week that, that want to get prayer. And if that's you, we want, we want to see God move in your life. Amen. So, Lord, I just ask you for anybody that comes up for prayer today. It could be for salvation. It could be rededication of their life. It could be for addictions being broken off their life. It could be for physical healing, for relational situation, for job stress. Whatever the need is, Lord, you are able to meet that need. And we just agree right now, this is a holy place. And that heaven and earth meet at that holy place. And whatever is needed in your people's lives, you will meet that need. And, and, and what we sang earlier, exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you all. Have an awesome day. See you in the upper room if you go to fellowship or see you at the altar.